<laughs> hey everyone, it's Alyssa and Nicole here with Blondes Breaking Down Real Estate. We're continuing our second part of our video series on contingencies. Today we're going to be focusing on, I think, the most important contingency when you're buying a home, which is the inspection contingency. And to help us today is the owner of the real estate inspection company, Philippe Heller. Uh, Nicole and I both use him and his team of inspectors for our buyers. We highly recommend them. They've been the most proficient team we've found. So without further ado, we're super excited to have you, Philippe. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself? Sure. Um, the real estate inspection company started in 2004. It was just me. Uh, and um, I've been really fortunate. We grew even through the recession in, in 08. And uh, we just, uh, you know, we strive on doing the best job we can and using technology and making uh, everyone's job as easy as possible and educating buyers along the way. That's what we love to do. Awesome. Yeah. So just to kind of give a little bit of background info, um, specifically on a home inspection and the inspection contingency, when a buyer is submitting an offer on a property, included in that offer is a number of days that's allocated for your inspection contingency. It can be any number of days. It's totally negotiable. Typically, you want to make sure to give yourself enough time to get an inspector out to the home, do the inspection, complete their report, time to review that report with your agent, schedule any further inspections, you know, like mold testing or, you know, a sewer scope uh, based off the general home inspection, whatever that says, if there's any further reports that need to be done, you got to have time to get those done as well. Then get repair quotes, you know, from a couple different contractors, submit and negotiate a request for repairs with the sellers and come to an agreement. And so that- All in 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you only have 10 days to get it done, but with great agents like Alyssa and myself, we can get that done for you. So with that in mind, um, Felipe, uh, why don't you kind of give us a little insight, maybe even share uh, your craziest or most terrifying uh, inspection story? Well, there's always something new. It's, it's amazing. I've been doing this for 16 years and I'm not out in the field anymore, but um, I put in my time and my guys all share uh, their pictures, of course, and everything from skunks in a crawl space to, you know, <laughs> loaded guns, like you get up into that attic and they're just right there on the, on the top shelf of the closet to um, just some crazy stuff, like people living in, in with mold and just one of the craziest things one of my guys ever found, he got, went up to a house and there was a coffin, like a real oh. coffin on the front porch, on one of the little rolly things, like in a hearse. And it was just, you know, it's, we never know what we're going to find when we get there. So it's, it's pretty wild. Well, I was going to ask you, because my boyfriend and I have been watching a ton of ghost adventures lately. Any uh, paranormal activity that you've ever found or experienced? <laughs> you know, I, the closest for me is going up into an attic, and obviously they're very dark, and, and you take your flashlight, and they have sometimes Halloween decorations oh. up there. And you turn around, and some ghoulish thing is like, <laughs> like this, right? And it's a heart stopper. But uh, not, I mean, we're not there at night. We have been in some... We have been in some neat houses like down in Coronado that are just these mansions from the 20s that you could imagine have uh, stories to tell and, and that the walls probably talk at night. But uh, I haven't, haven't seen anything firsthand. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. All right, Alyssa, we've got tons of questions for you here. Why don't you start us off? Yeah. So Philippe, why don't you just go into the general home inspection? Because that's essentially what our buyers are going to be contacting you for from the gate and just explain exactly what that is. Sure. Well, uh, home inspections has evolved. It's a fairly new service. It really started in the 80s when buyers started, um, you know, there started to be lawsuits. A buyer would buy a house and, and then sue because something was wrong. So buyers started to ask contractor friends, hey, can you come out and check out this house that I'm going to buy? It was very kind of uh, casual. And then it started to get more formalized with, with forms that somebody would fill out and they started developing kind of a standard checklist of things that they would um, look at. I found a home inspection from my home. It was originally built in 86 and this inspection was done sometime in the late 80s and it was about 12 pages long and it was just like typed out on Microsoft Word, really basic. Um, obviously they've evolved. The depth and breadth of the inspections has increased dramatically as technology and the knowledge of homes and the concerns of buyers has evolved. Now it's, now it's certainly a huge industry. 
uh, over 80% of the homes that are sold in the United States do have a home inspection. Um, and so it's, it's like ingrained as part of a transaction. And the whole purpose is to inform and educate the buyer on the actual condition of a home and, and reveal any defects that may not have been disclosed just so that they really know what they're buying. Awesome. So what are, what would you say are the biggest red flags for a buyer on a home inspection report? I'm sure there's plenty, but give us your top four. Well, you know, certainly um, er almost everything is repairable, right? It's just a matter of money. Uh, so the big ticket items, the most uh, difficult to fix are probably cracks or structural issues based on geological issues, meaning it's on a hill or there's earth movement or, you know, it's very hard to move a house, right? Obviously you can lift them and redo a foundation. Those things are extremely costly. So houses like in La Jolla or anywhere that um, there's earth movement occurring and it's causing the structure to be affected, that, that's, a, that's like major stuff. And, you know, even when you're just looking at houses, if you're not an expert, when you see signs of settlement and doors that don't close because the frame is racked and, um, you know, windows are hard to open and shut, you can see light at the top of the doors. Those are issues that should, you know, put a red flag in your mind saying something's not square about this house. So I, I, that may be an issue coming up. Other than that, um, old roofs. Uh, obviously roofs are not cheap. They can go, I'd say for the simplest little rectangular house, one story, simple gable roof, maybe five or six grand for an asphalt roof up to tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands on a nice bigger house in Rancho Santa Fe with a, a nice Mexican tile roof. It could be very, very costly. So big roof problems would be another. And then uh, let's see another Another big one, mold issues, of course, if there is a, a, an ongoing problem with moisture and um, has caused some significant mold damage, that can be costly to remediate as well. Mm. So those would be probably my big ticket items that we see. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, thank you. And we're going to get into more of those items and what to look for um, in a minute. Uh, a lot of our clients get intimidated because some of the reports I've gotten from you guys can be up to like 150 pages and it freaks people out. Uh, what do you have to say to home? Huh? So even when we tell them you're going to get a long report. <laughs> well, I want to, I want to put it in a little bit into perspective. Um, home inspection reports now include a lot of photos and we also report like we, and I can only really speak about our company, of course, because I'm most familiar with our processes. We document all the things that we check that are working properly, as well as the defects we find. And, and there's a couple reasons for it. One is it, um, it balances the report, so it's not just all negative things. And it also helps the buyer in the event that they have a home warranty claim after they move in, shortly after they move in, a lot of home warranty companies are known for uh, declining claims. Oh, the microwave must have been work, or it must not have been working Prior to their people. way out of it. Yeah. Yeah. They always try and talk their way out. So now with our reports where we have an affirmative comment saying this item was functional at the time of the inspection, it's very hard for the uh, home warranty companies to, to decline that coverage because now we have proof that it was working. Mm -hmm. So yes, they are bigger than ever. Um, but it's, it's number one, it's um, reporting on all the positive things. So people should be happy about that. Uh, and it also, we include a lot of pictures and, and even video now to confirm that not only did we do our job, but that things are working well. You know, we put pictures in, for example, we don't just say, yeah, your AC worked, it's good to go. Now we actually put thermal images of the AC working so we can see, people can see the temperature, not just what we type in. They can actually look at a thermal image. Same thing with a furnace, same thing with an electric panel or uh, a plumbing issue. We actually have thermal images to convey what we're seeing on site. So yes, reports have gotten longer and longer. Um, we do have a summary at the end, which only lists the defects if that's all somebody's interested in. Um, but it can be intimidating. And uh, one of the things that we do is I wrote a series of white papers on what to expect when buying an older home. And we have them for different time periods. A lot of popular houses in San Diego are built in the 50s. And there are things that 
let's say millennials, uh, for example, may never have lived in an old home, but right now that's what they can afford. They want to move, you know, North Park or something, and they, they found this great little craftsman house that they just love. Well, there are things that are different about that house than a house that was built in the 80s or 90s or newer. Uh, and so we try to put that in perspective by giving uh, an evaluation to buyers. If they want to read it, they're free. And they say, this is what you can expect to find in a house, in a house built in the 1950s. It, it talks about cast iron plumbing and it talks about fuses and single pane windows and the lack of insulation and all those things trying to set the expectations for buyers. So we do try and put it in perspective as best we can. That's great. And we'll, we'll get those. Are those on your website? Yep. Yes. We'll pull those and Perfect. create a resource for anybody who wants them. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> so, you know, we, we kind of went over some of the big ticket items, like you said, uh, roofs, foundation, structural issues. What, you know, with your experience, what would make you walk away from a home? Um, I think it, it's all very budget and, and kind of skill level based. So, you know, if I'm handy and I'm willing to put in some sweat equity, maybe I'm looking for that great deal and I'm looking for that house that looks a little shabby and needs new cabinets and, and, the, and the bathrooms need to be redone, but I can do that, right? I can go and order new cabinets. Um, I can do the simple plumbing required. So, you know, it's very much based on each person's skill. I mean, we've talked to people that um, they could not hang a ceiling fan or change a faucet uh, and so they want to buy a house that is turnkey, right? Or just have everything repaired. So they're going to be a lot more freaked out by a home inspection report that points out a lot of deferred maintenance or aged items. Everything in a house ages just like on a car and eventually needs to be replaced. So they're going to be freaked out because they're thinking, well, I can't do any of this. I got to hire somebody to do that and to, um, you know, paint and replace fixtures and do all these things. And so I think it's very much uh, how much budget you have and your ability to, to do these things yourself. Um, for me, uh, I mean, gosh, I, like I said at the beginning, you know, structural issue is, is for me might be a problem, like because of the cost involved, unless you're getting the house for such a steal that it makes sense, you know, right? It's a trade-off. Uh, what we like to say is every house is right for somebody. It just may not be right for that buyer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody's willing to take on that house regardless of the condition. Yeah. So talk, let's talk about condition a little bit in regards to, um, you know, you mentioned doors not being able to close properly and, you know, some type, sometimes the windows look a little bit off. What are some other things that if you were walking through a home as a first time home buyer, you know, with your realtor or without that, that you, you know, our quick, our quick reference items to yeah. say, oh, there might be an issue with the roof or there might be an yeah. issue with the plumbing. Is there anything that they can be looking for as they go through? Well, uh, let me put you in the mind of a home inspector, for example, before I would go to a house, usually the night before as I was prepping my next day, I would go online and look at the home, like look at all the listing photos and look at the age of the home. So I knew uh, before I even pulled up to the house, some you know, top the 10 things that I'm going to be looking at. If the house is more than 30, 35 years old, I'm really going to take a close look at the roof and the underlayment because that tar paper that's underneath even a tile roof could be at the end of its life. And that's a costly thing, a, a lift and lay, they call it, where they lift all the tile, put new paper down, and um, relay the tile. I live in the San Diego country states in Ramona, and a ton of the houses are in that time frame. So it's an ongoing thing now. All the houses are about 30 years old, 35 years old, and they're all getting new roofs because of the amount of sun we get up here. So, you know, you see it going on all the time. So uh, that I would look if it's a- So if the house is 30-ish years old, be sure to know if the roof has been replaced. If not, it's yeah. probably going to fall on you. It may, yeah. You may want to budget for that. It's coming up. You know, every, every roof needs that at some point. Um, I would look for, you know, if it's older than that, I know it's a crawl space. So I'm definitely going to be looking at ventilation and grading issues and maybe cast iron. So if it's an older home, um, I'm going to want to look and see if, if it's got cast iron plumbing because cast iron plumbing also have a, has a lifespan of about 50 years. And what happens is metal rusts and uh, the pipes kind of close like a bad artery. So you're going to have poor drainage. And if they crack, you might get roots in there and it could be problematic and obviously costly to fix. 
uh, electrical what year, system. What year is the target for that? Like if the house is built prior to yeah. what year should we 40, be? Yeah, I'd say 45 to about 1970. Um, I would be, okay. they're likely to have cast iron plumbing. So um, if you're going after a house that's 1970 or earlier, you can, when you're ordering your home inspection, just get the pipe inspection from the gate, would you say? Yes. Uh, that, for sure, get the sewer scope inspection. Um, and, and you want to make sure, and we're going to report on its presence draft. So that way your clients won't be surprised if we come back and say, hey, it's got cast iron plumbing. No, what is that? Again, that's in the white paper. It explains what that is and what the shortcomings are. Um, so uh, that's another one I would look for. And also the electrical system. Remember older homes, um, 50s, 60s, even into the 80s, really, we didn't have all of the items that we have today. Like every room has a TV and a gaming console and computers and, you know, so many things plugged in now. Um, life was a lot easier and simpler, I should say, in the 50s and 60s. Even in the 80s, if you think about it, houses did not automatically have a built-in microwave. They did not have a garage door opener. They didn't have many of the things that we just take for granted today that, that are just common in a home. So, so they used a lot less electricity. Yeah, a lot less electricity, a lot less demand, a lot fewer things plugged in at the same time. Uh, so, you know, that's something else I'm going to be looking at as a buyer is what's the capacity of the panel? Am I going to want to put in a hot tub or maybe even a pool? Am I going to want to put in solar? Am I going to, you know, does my family have, you know, tons of computers, like I said, and all these different things that we need to plug in? Is my house just going to be a, a rat's nest of, of extension cords? So that's something else, you know, houses back in the 40s and 50s may have only had one uh, receptacle in a bedroom because all you really had plugged in back then, we didn't even have TVs, right? Well, I wasn't around in the 50s, but <laughs> even TVs. So you had a, maybe a, a lamp and maybe a clock in a bedroom that's all what else did you need electricity in a bedroom for nothing uh kitchens too you had one receptacle on the counter for a percolator maybe a toaster you didn't have countertop microwaves and stand mixers and you know on and on and on like we do today so if i'm buying an older home that's something i'm going to think about so a lot of these older homes are being flipped nowadays yeah. what <laughs> what are some signs of a cheap flip yes <laughs> Now, I love the idea of flipped houses because people are buying houses that are undesirable. It's like, it's like rescuing a dog from the pound, right? You're getting something that nobody wants and, and you're giving it new life. And so I love the idea of it and you're, they're revitalizing neighborhoods, they're revitalizing homes that, that otherwise might be torn down or just rented out and, and just you know horrible. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is you have people who read a book or go to one seminar and they think that they can do this and they try to do it cheap and they don't pull permits. They're not contractors. Um, they're not hiring licensed contractors. And therefore they're doing things that are not only not up to code, but can be downright dangerous. Like if you're not wiring something properly, you're mixing aluminum wire with copper wire. You're, you know, you're, you're not, we've seen, I can't even tell you how many, houses flips that we've seen where it had cast iron plumbing and they didn't even connect. Like there's a disconnect and everything's dumping. All the sewage is dumping under the house. Oh. It is vile. It is gross and it's unhealthy and it's very costly to fix something like that. So uh, I would say if I was going to buy a flip and they look beautiful, you walk in new appliances, new counters, they look great, but I would definitely ask for um, permits. Mm -hmm. I would do a permit check. If, if you can, I would ask the sellers, if they did not pull permits, um, I've heard horror stories of room additions or even second stories being added without permits. And then uh, later on, the uh, county building department comes by and they make them tear it all down or they have to uh -huh. rip it open and make sure it was built up to code. They didn't put, they want to check the um, tie down bolts. They want to check the, you know, the spacing the of the studs and the wiring. Yeah. So it could be a real nightmare to buy a flip from just some person who did a flip because they fancied themselves a, a contractor. So that's another reason why you really want to have a thorough inspection and somebody who understands like you may see three prong receptacles throughout the house. It looks modern, right? But when we open up the electric panel and there's no ground wires and it's an undersized panel and we go back and we say, okay, these are all bootleg grounds. It's not really grounded. It's not as safe. Um, there are no GFCI receptacles. It's an undersized panel, which means they just strung all these nice new recessed lights and countertop 
you know, plugs, everything is on one. As soon as you turn, as soon as you plug in your fridge, everything turns off and breaks. That's we've all probably been in a house like that where you, you plug some, turn on the microwave and you, and you trip a circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a sign. So that's one thing I would be very careful of with flip houses. Perfect. Thank you. And then, okay. So kind of going on a more positive light, are there any items that come up frequently that are kind of like common and shouldn't really freak a buyer out? Absolutely. Most, I would say most of what's in a report should not freak most level-headed buyers out. The problem is our houses are so expensive in San Diego. You think, oh my gosh, I'm paying, you know, almost a million dollars for this house. It should be pretty tip top shape, but things like in 90% of the houses, there's no anti tip bracket. Mm -hmm. um, there are simple like bathroom fans that may be worn out and making noise or not drawing very well. Um, you know, really a worn out bathroom fixture. It's not that much, 100, 150 bucks for a nice one. And it's a great way to learn how to do something. Be handy so, as a homeowner. <laughs> yes, you're a homeowner now, right? Learn how to fix the basics. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of little things that mostly come down to deferred maintenance. And, you know, if you want to take on the challenge, most of that stuff you can catch up on. Maybe you can negotiate a little bit uh, on the price. That's, that's your expertise, not ours. Um, you'll never, you should never hear a home inspector. Uh, Hi, guys. Sheba. <laughs> uh, we haven't had our employees in the office, so we've been bringing our dogs. So that happens sometimes. Uh, the, uh, the neighbor girl likes to come ring the doorbell in the middle of my work day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Distancing people. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, uh, let's see. Talking. Oh, yeah. So, you know, homeowners should, if they're going to be buying a home, they should at least be prepared to do some some basic maintenance in their house. And I would say, that, and it's probably your experience too, that yes, that list of repairs looks quite long, but really most of it is pretty, pretty, pretty minor stuff, I think, on the, in the big picture. Yeah, definitely. And you can even argue that replacing a water heater is pretty minor. It's like buying a car and expecting never to buy tires. You know, it happens, right? You have to spend 800 or 1,000 bucks getting a new set of tires, um, and it's just part of owning a car, just like when you own a home, you're going to paint, you're going to, you know, you're going to replace the water heater, you're going to eventually replace appliances. So when they break, it's not hopefully something that people freak out over. Totally. What about, um, you know, like you said, there are quite a few inspection companies out there and we'd hope that everyone would use you, especially now that we've got this video out there. But if someone's looking for an inspector or an inspection company, what, what things would you have them ask the inspector to verify that they are, you know, legitimate inspector qualified. company and qualified? Yeah, California is not a, what we call a licensed state. So like you realtors are all licensed uh, by the state of California. Contractors are licensed. Home inspectors are not. In many states they are, uh, but for some reason in such a heavily regulated state, home inspectors are not licensed. So it's not a question you can ask, hey, do you have a license? Because nobody does. Um, what you want to ask is, of course, evaluate them on how long have they been in business? Uh, do they stand behind their work? Do they have you know, good, good reviews online? If they only have three reviews from family members, obviously that, that, that says that they probably haven't been around too much or they're just very forgettable companies. So you wanna do your homework, just like with any professional that you're hiring. You wanna make sure that they are insured. Uh, that they um, at least belong to one of several associations, home inspector associations like InterNACHI, ASHI, CREA. There are several of them out there that um, at least have a, a, a standard of practice to which we do our inspections. So you want to find that out as well. You know, we have a little, one of the things we can say is that with the number of inspectors that we have, our guys are on a group chat. Like they can ask each other questions all day long. Hey, I've never seen this. What do you think? So when one of our guys shows up, it's like having 12 guys show up because you've got that shared knowledge base. And, you know, this conference room that I'm sitting in right now, we bring our guys in here and we train them. We're not just doing online classes occasionally. Like we bring professionals in here and we do face-to-face -face training. So you want to find out like, how are they learning? Where did they get their experience or certification from? How do they keep up with changes in technology? You know, high efficiency furnaces, pool systems that change all the time. Uh, so those, those are kinds of the things you want to do. Um, the last thing I would 
rely upon is just trying to find the cheapest home inspection. That might be okay when you're just trying to snake a drain line because it's such a, you know, kind of a generic service. That's one thing. You still want to make sure that that plumber's going to have insurance and stand behind their work in case something gets screwed up. Um, but, you know, just home inspections, look at their reports, look at the equipment they're using. Um, talk to them, give them a call. A lot of times it's, it's amazing. They're not cheap, right? Home inspections are not cheap. And a lot of people never talk to the home inspector until they show up, but you can pick up the phone and call and, and kind of talk, you know, ask them the questions that you're asking. What should I be looking for? What should I be concerned with? What are your reports like? How quick will you get me my report back? Things of that nature. So those are all really important ways uh, or indicators that a home inspector is legit, experienced, and they're going to stand behind their work. And it, you know, it happens. One of our guys missed a broken garage door spring. It just, you, you, you couldn't see it. A uh, buyer moved in said, hey, my garage door spring's broken. You know what? It was, we're going to send somebody out there to get it fixed. And that's how we stand behind our work. We should have found it. And so we're going to get it fixed because we didn't. And that's what you want. You don't want somebody who's going to hide behind their contract, someone who's going to, you know, not answer their phone. Um, anyway, those are the, some of the things that you should be thinking about when hiring a home inspector. Wonderful. And I've had, I've had issues come up that inspectors have missed. They weren't you guys. And they do. They kind of get out of it through the codes of con conduct or something. And so they yeah. weasel their way out of it. And I know that you guys do stand by your work. So if you miss something and you feel that you are accountable, you take accountability. So that's awesome. And then you had touched on technology. One thing that I've noticed that you guys have that some companies don't is you guys have a ton of gadgets. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? I know we're running out of time. Yeah, sure. Real quick. So um, uh, I was one of the first to include thermal imaging in every inspection way back in like 2006. And that's when those thermal imaging cameras were like $11,000. It was insane. But I saw it as a way to do a better inspection. Uh, they're more common now, but they're amazing. Like if you're, if you're thinking of hiring a home inspector that doesn't use it, you are really shortchanging yourself. We can find moisture that you can't see with the naked eye. We can find overheated um, electrical and we check it, use it for uh, heating and air conditioning. We have, uh, you know, vol voltage testers. We're checking for polarity, for safety. Um, we're using, we have pole cams now. Not only do we not want to damage a roof, but we want to keep our guys safe. So we have these high resolution cameras. We don't, we chose not to use drones because there are a lot of flight restrictions. So many places in San Diego are close to an airport, um, limited battery life, et cetera, et cetera. So we use high resolution cameras on a uh, carbon fiber pole and we're having great results with it. Um, Gosh, we go on, we have carbon monoxide detectors, gas uh, sniffers that we use to find gas leaks in a house. Um, uh, a whole, so many things, microwave testers that we put in so we can actually take a picture to prove, like I said before, that a microwave is working because it lights up. Uh, so a lot of neat stuff that's, that's coming down for, for home inspectors. Rather in the old days, it was a flashlight and a screwdriver and a ladder and that was it. Now we come up with a bunch, thousands of dollars worth of equipment to test your house. That's Very cool. cool. And just before we uh, wrap this up, you guys are still in operation during COVID and what, what's changed for you? Well, we, we have been the whole time. Uh, we've been essential as you are. It has changed. So we're, you know, we've always been concerned with viruses and, and protective gear. That's why our guys wear the Tyvek suits and the masks when they crawl under a house. We're all, we've always run the risk of being exposed to hantavirus and whatever else is in these sometimes dirty houses. So we've always been careful about our PPE and protecting our, our employees. Um, so what's changed is our guys love to share and this has been very awkward for them not sharing their knowledge, not being able to talk someone through a home inspection and just condensing it to a FaceTime meeting or a phone call after the fact. Um, that's probably the, the, the weirdest thing and also you know, really wiping everything down uh, on our way out of the house just to leave it spotless as we found it. So those are some of the things. Um, the market has slowed a little during this time, but we, we've been very, very busy and we're ramping back up. So we're almost back to normal for where we should be at this time of year. Great. Very cool. You got any other questions, Alyssa? I don't think so. Uh, one thing really quick, asbestos, mold, lead-based paint, radon gas. Which of those should people be aware of in, in San Diego and which um, should they not really care about? Sure. You don't have to care about radon because according to the EPA, 
we don't have radon gas in San Diego. It's such a low occurrence of radon that it's not considered a health hazard. Uh, but it is, it is a poisonous gas. And if you have clients moving from back east or even in Northern California down to here, they may ask you about radon, but um, I can show you the maps. We just don't have radon here. Um, lead, asbestos, and uh, what else did you ask me about? Mold. <laughs> Mold, okay. Um, lead in, mostly in paint. We don't really have lead water mains here. That's kind of Midwest stuff. Uh, but we do have lead in the paint and it's likely in any house built prior to 1979 uh, could have lead-based paint. So if it's in good condition and it has been painted over, you probably don't have to worry about it. If it's peeling and flaking, it can be a problem and it can be costly to remove and contain. Uh, it's almost like doing mold remediation. And of course mold, honestly, the, most mold can be cleaned up for probably a couple thousand bucks. It's usually right by a tub or it's underneath a toilet if, uh, and a wood frame floor not the end of the world, but it can be a significant problem. So if you come into a house that you're looking at and they have oil burners or some sort of scents all over the place, they're hiding something. It's either pet smell, cigarette smell, or mold smell. And if you, if you have a musty odor, you may want to go ahead and get a mold inspection done. We include a visual mold assessment, so we're going to point out anything in the house that may be conducive to mold growth. Um, and that's not a mold test, but it's saying, hey, look, the ventilation's bad or the grading is bad and water's directed towards the home. And so mold could, could occur. And the moisture home. meters, I'm sure, help with that too. Exactly. And we check moisture with the thermal cameras and the moisture meters. Um, Perfect. So and that's then the, the last thing would be asbestos. And I think uh, yeah. what's the target year for that that people need to be aware of? Pretty much the same as, uh, which is prior to 1979. And then... Um, you, you know, asbestos, as long as you don't break anything up and breathe in the dust, it's not going to be a problem. Like there's asbestos in, um, in plaster when they used to plaster walls and in joint compound and even in old vinyl flooring and um, linoleum flooring had it. Uh, it was great stuff. It keeps fires from spreading. They put it in the popcorn ceiling so that if a fire did start, it wouldn't spread as quickly. So for its intended purpose, it's a great product and doesn't burn. The problem comes in is if you're going to scrape that ceiling, uh, that's when you get uh, airborne. You, you make it airborne and you can breathe it in and it becomes a problem in the house. It can all be removed, but yeah, it's one of those things. Hire somebody to do it right so that you don't contaminate your own home. Perfect. Cool. Well, anything else? You know, the only other thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to throw this one thing in that we've noticed a big change in during COVID is more sellers are getting pre-listing inspections. And it's not a sales pitch on my part, but we do strongly feel that it does put uh, power back into the hands of the seller because they can get out in front of any problems and usually get things corrected a lot cheaper than waiting till the 11th hour when the buyer's in there making a big deal out of it. Um, so that's one thing that we've seen change and we think it's a great idea for the sellers to do that and um, helps the realtors to price the house correctly and have that frank conversation with the sellers about what needs to be fixed or what's going to come up during the contingency period. 100%. And we've seen those as so helpful for sellers as well. Yeah. So. Cool. Anything else? No, nope, I'm good on my end. Well, you awesome. guys are great. Very thorough and, and we appreciate you supporting us. And, um, you know, we always try and do the best job we can at every inspection. So I appreciate you having me on today. Great, well thank you again so much for coming on. Hopefully everybody watching this video has learned something new about the inspection contingency and home inspections in general. Uh, definitely when it's your time to order a home inspection, make sure you call the real estate inspection company. Uh, that goes for buyers as well as any agents watching. This is the team that you can count on. We definitely do and we've had very successful transactions with them in the past. So, well, thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> you guys are great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Philippe. Bye. All right. Bye.